Hey friends, my name is Jesse, one of the pastors. Welcome to the weekly for the week of September 17th. Today we're talking about advocating for the marginalized. So this week in Acts chapter 11, 1 through 18, three quarters of our text is Peter summarizing what had happened in Acts chapter 10. What's different in this situation is that Peter was in Caesarea and then he goes down to Jerusalem and there's these uh, Christians who are circumcised. They're Jews who became Christian and probably the leaders of the church in Jerusalem and they are criticizing Peter to his face because he went into Cornelius' house and ate with him and his whole household, and they are not okay with this kind of association, with this kind of relationship, with sharing this kind of intimate space with Gentiles. You see, they have a bias against Gentiles. They have this preconceived ideas of who the Gentiles are and the, in, the uncleanness of them that is really not true. And we have bias uh, that we have against other people that in many ways are probably not true. We have social bias against different kinds of uh, social groups. We have political bias against other kind of political parties. We have religious bias against other kinds of religions or other sects or brands of Christianity. We have racial bias against other kinds of race and ethnic groups. Um, we have bias against certain kinds of sin and si groups of sin. Uh, certain kind of sexual sin in particular can really, uh, we can have bias against. And so Peter is confronted with uh, this bias that these Christian leaders have in Jerusalem. And he tells the story of what God did uh, with Cornelius. And so um, John Stott, a theologian, he says that, that in the... The story that he tells, God is delivering four different hammer blows, just hammering and demolishing uh, racism and superiority, specifically uh, religious uh, superiority and, and ethnic racism. And so the first one is a divine vision. God speaks to Peter in a vision and basically says, do not call them unclean. Um, they were disgusted by the Gentiles. The Jews were disgusted. It viscerally felt disgusted by them. And I gave the analogy of a Dixie cup. And if you hold the Dixie cup and you, hold on, if you spit into the Dixie cup and then you drink your own spit, the idea of it is disgusting, right? But what are we disgusted by? It's the same spit that's in our mouth and it really isn't disgusting, but we're disgusted by it even though we don't need to be. We have this disgust for different kinds of people, whether we can realize it or not. And they have this disgust for Gentiles that God is delivering a hammer blow to and saying, do not call them disgusting or unclean. The second part is that God gives a divine command. He, he tells Peter to go without any hesitation. You need to not just understand this, Peter, in your head, but you need to put it into action. You need to begin to go and have faith in this. And so um, it's not an intellectual ascent. It is action that God wants to do and God is commanding us. The, four, the third hammer blow to break down racism and superiority is divine preparation. God was working through the Gentiles. God was working through Cornelius before he heard the gospel, before he got saved. God is moving among these, quote, disgusting people, these, these um, marginalized people, and we need to recognize God is moving in other people, um, and we, can, we need to identify that. And the fourth uh, is divine action. God demolishes racism and superiority um, by... Uh, when Peter is preaching, the Holy Spirit falls and salvation is open to all people. And we at Grace Church, we say that one of our core values is that we are gospel community. And part of what that means is that we are a multi-ethnic, multicultural gospel community that God envisions for the church and where we are going as a future reality in uh, the new heaven and new earth in Revelation chapter 7. And so God removed the superiority in Peter's heart. And then God is now asking Peter to go and advocate on behalf 
of these marginalized Gentile people uh, to the, the Christian leaders in Jerusalem so that there be change inside of the church uh, through Peter bringing change to these people. Um, and we see that after Peter is done telling the story that they are left speechless and they begin to praise God for the inclusion of Gentiles, these marginalized, disgusting people, that they are now included into the body of Christ. So I want to take a moment to talk about how does Peter go, how does Peter become an advocate? The first thing is that he, we need to be open for God to teach you something. So I'm going to parallel how God moves in Peter and then how God wants to move in us to be an advocate, just like Peter. So the first one is be open for God to teach you something new. If there is anybody who could claim that they had the ability to know it all about the church, it's Peter. Jesus said, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. I'm going to build my church upon the rock. He, Peter established the church and then he, uh, and then he is approving the different churches happening. But Peter had more to learn. God wanted to teach Peter something uh, in, in Acts chapter 10. And we need to have a similar posture of Peter and like, God, we know a lot about you, but we have more to learn. So number one, be open for God to teach you something new about his heart for people. Number two, identify personal barriers to relationships with the disgusting people, the marginalized people that you have in your life. Who are those people? Are, the pe- are they people that are too loud? Are they people that are too quiet? Are they people who you feel like have a certain kind of agenda, maybe a political agenda, maybe a parent that parents differently than you and you judge them and and kind of look down on them because of the way that they parent. Um, Maybe uh, someone that's poor or dirty or disgusting. We have these um, barriers to building relationships with people. Um, and And the idea of creating relationships with these kinds of people uh, really creates a dissonance, an uncomfort in us. We need to stop making assumptions about people. We need to stop calling people and their behaviors weird, but just different from ours. And these are just little ways that we can begin to remove the barriers. The third thing is that we enter into relationship with different people. We need to enter into relationships like Peter did. Peter went into Cornelius' house and ate a meal with him and got to know Cornelius and his whole household and all of the people in the household. We need to meet um, with families. We need to get into their world. We need to uh, build real relationships with people that are hard for us to do that with. We cannot advocate, which is the next step. We cannot advocate for people until we know those people, until we begin to have a real authentic love for those people. So the fourth thing is after entering a relationship, you advocate for outsiders. You advocate for the marginalized, that they should be accepted and welcomed and loved and included in the church and fall in love with Jesus. Um, Peter uses his influence to take out the hammer and to destroy uh, the marginalization, the, uh, the superiority, the racist tendencies. Peter uses his influence to break it down. We need to uh, go to critical people, and this is specifically happening within the church. Uh, Peter is identifying people in the church. We can go to people who are critical, just like they were critical of Peter, and help break down those barriers for other people. This is one way we advocate for the outsiders. You have the ability to help those critical uh, begin to love and be open to uh, those outsiders, those marginalized, those that don't feel like they belong in church. And then the fifth and final thing is tell your story of God. And in order to include more people, this is what Peter does. He tells his story. He's just authentic about how he has come to really appreciate and see God working in Cornelius and the family. Um, And then what happens is that the people in the church, their hearts are changed and they're like, man, we cannot stand against this. Praise God for what he is doing. And so we have a vision of being a multi-ethnic church, uh, a multicultural church. And I believe that 
um, that when this happens, we as Grace Church become a witness to the world because let's be honest, the world is become, becoming more polarized and isolated and broken and separated and segmented. And if we, we have the gospel, we have the good news, and if we can live this out, it will be a demonstration to the world of the good news of Jesus. And I believe people will be attracted to it and become followers of Jesus. And so, in your house church, you have a number of questions to discuss. This is a sensitive topic. And so I really want to encourage everybody to, be, to come humble, to come with humility, to be kind, and to create a safe environment. Enjoy the discussion.